I don't want to be what the institution has become. This is not, this is not an organization. And that's what we do in America. This is an organism. It is fluid and living and growing and so, so tender. And it is very frail and it's very complicated. People run when they're corrected. People don't want, they don't even know that God has directed you to a house. And the reason why you're not blessed is because you're in the wrong house. But that's what scripture says. But I want to go where I'm entertained or where the programs are better. And that's not how this thing rolled out. It had nothing to do with programs. It had nothing to do with a superstar. Paul, they said, was such a bad outward word teacher that he bored people to death. But he would talk for hours and hours and everybody else would come together and share the revelation. I did, um, I found this. You see the logs there? It says, these trees were 17 years old when harvested. The smaller one competed for space with the large plot of other trees. And the larger one was planted out in the open area. And being unfettered, although we took a couple beatings, just, just, I think more leaders grew, more people had opportunity. I mean, there is nothing here we won't do for you. We have given you a platform to launch off our backs, and we find delight in that. It's your turn. Oh, gosh. You know, you call the pastor for the burial, the marial, the problem, the wedding, the marriage fights, the financial problems. It should be us. Um, you want to have elders, people who have walked longer, and they're all here. You should take them out to dinner or lunch. You know how many people? I am not their pastor. I have been an influencer and big deal. Go to YouTube if you want to be influenced. I'm, I'm not, I mean, like, I want to lead you to Jesus. And then I want to see Jesus have you lead people to him. And that's when we know we're doing a good job. And you say, no, that's the pastor's job. That's, that's Americanized. That's not true. We are going to serve people who serve people. That's where our best energy will go. If we see you serving, if we see you putting out a hand and extending, if we see you boots on the ground, there's nothing we won't do for you. We're going to serve people who serve people. We're going to, um, we're going to continue to serve those who are seeking and to help those who are being discipled become who God's called them to be. So it goes on to say, uh, the crowded classroom with the high school student teacher ratio and the other one is smaller classroom. This was teaching about learning, but I feel like um, part of our, 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 our success over the last 17 years is um, also our weakness. Would you like to share on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we first started, I'm an administrator. I mean, I'll orchestrate the snot out of anything. I'm almost to a degree that's unnecessary. Overhelper. Uh, yeah, overhelper. Um, so when we started, I really fought against myself to hear the Holy Spirit and do what he wanted to do, to make it really fair for everybody and safe, but I didn't really need to over-engineer this. You know what I'm saying? This can be as simple as simple gets, and Jesus will still be in the middle of it, and the Holy Spirit will talk to everybody here. Um. So I would have people come in, and they would they'd want a program, because we get used to, and all your church's experiences are different here in the room. Um, you could come from a big church with just really program-driven. Um, my background, my roots is in the Methodist church, and the Methodist can really have a great program and never deviate from the program, and you can come in and go out, and you can stay right on track, and it gives you a sense of security and no Jesus whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Bless your little Methodist heart if you came from the, that. I don't mean to offend anybody, but, uh, but that was just my experience. I can only talk about me. Um, 
and if you stay around for about a year and a half, you'll know everything about me, and it's quite boring, actually. <laughs> um, so I fought against um, really setting up something that was um, um, hard driving. We had a couple people at first on the board that really wanted to set our guiding documents up, and even to the nuance of how to remove the pastor. And I'm like, all right, hang on a minute. <laughs> I said, why don't we just let the Holy Spirit run this and just see where it goes? So we really did set it up like a big home group, not a small home group that's now a little bigger. So one of the, you'll notice two things when you come in, that one of the greatest freedoms that we have is because of lack of organization. Our greatest weakness is lack of organization because of that. But it requires all of us to hear the Holy Spirit. Um, if you come into a church setting and you're looking for a church and you see things right that you love and you can really sign on to, then serve it, give to it, and help lead it. If you see things that are wrong in here, serve it, give to it, and lead it. Don't run. If you keep running, you'll just run to the next sheep shack down the road and never grow. You can find a church bigger than this that you can become lost in and not grow. And that's the most dangerous thing for me in my life, that I can get so comfortable and never hear his voice. That's sad. It's sad to me. And so that's what we're not trying to accomplish. That's not what we're not trying to do. And Kathy and I don't want to be the only voices in the room. That's why we said we have a prayer mic, wherever it is. I think I have it in my hand. That when someone has something to offer, come up. This should... In a home group, you should speak, right? Everybody should have a voice. And so that's the way this is. It's set up small. It will probably always be small. Church growth says that you'll only grow to three-quarters of the size of a room. Look around. This is about all we're going to get, right? And so people cycle in and they cycle out because they come in and kick the tire and don't want to buy that car. Okay, fine. please go and find some place that you can purchase and invest your time and your talents into but if it's here then invest your time and talent into it and that's how we grow yeah so all of us having these gifts and talents and we'll we'll go through classes where and we have we, we actually um uh, we'll slate another one but we've gone through them many times about what you have to bring like you know writing or gift talent or you know, I think about Jeff, you're always right here, so I get, but he's got, he's a real artist, he makes cards, he does these beautiful, like, very kind things on the computer, and, and he organizes things, he uh, used to be an accountant, right, or he's probably always an accountant, once an accountant, I guess, but just everybody, uh, Shirley, like, Shirley, raise your hand back there, Shirley, raise up higher, please, come on, she, if you haven't been hugged by Shirley, she has the ministry of hug, she will draw you so close, and somehow she gets, she just worms her way right into your heart, and you're just talking this close to her. And it's okay. Like everybody else's personal space has to be here. Everybody has these gifts and these things that they bring. The thing that wrecks my heart is I don't want to see our youth not be part of that. I don't, I think if we were optimally working well, each one of you, and we've done this before, actually we've done this twice, where we assign you as a godparent over one of the youth in the house, where you're specifically their prayer covering and you give them gifts. And that's really what church should be. I would love when my beautiful granddaughter Nikki leaves and goes into Broadway and celebrates her career as an international star. Anyway, I'm just prophesying. But when she leaves, that she said that my church experience is what made me feel safe and this is why I want to go to church or be a part of a community today. Do you understand? Like that's what we're supposed to be creating. Not just like babysitting back there, but just an experience of them being known and being loved. So um, it, we are at Rosh Hashanah, and it's no surprise. I won't take long. Um, I'm going to have you do, I have Deuteronomy 16. But I want to show you something. I'm going to ask you to please indulge me. I have a seven-minute video that I'm about to show you, but I want to set it up. So... I've done this so many times that I bet you're bored with it. Me bringing you the feast of the Lord, I, I repented before God and I said, I'm sorry that I found them so familiar that I didn't reverence them anymore, Lord. That it's just kind of rote. And I don't want it to be that way with you. So in our history, 
Rosh Hashanah has been around so long, uh, 3,500 years if you're counting, uh, maybe even longer, I'm just trying to round it up. Um, there's always been giving to kingdoms. Even though America is a type of a empire, it's, it's, we don't understand the kingdom mindset. But when you got born again and baptized, you were immediately brought out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear light his, through his son. You're in a kingdom now. There's operational skills in this kingdom, and I'm asking you to know them and learn them. There's three places you can find out about how they were instituted for God's children. Not all the other kingdoms like Syria and Babylonia and all the Roman empires. I don't want you to know. Those kingdoms are very prevalent. We know them. But his kingdom is in Deuteronomy 23, Deuteronomy 16, and Malachi 3. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Leviticus. Apologize. It says, um, would you read that? I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. Thank you. <laughs> You're under a curse. Your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, and there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw out, open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there is not room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Look, I understand. I'm, I can't stand up. Okay, wait. I, okay, now I'll start trotting. But, it, okay, look, I know they want your money. They're just going to rip you off. They're going to buy a Cadillac. No, you know, not, not us. The, you know, that's the, what the, the culture has said. Church is all about money. It's a machine. And, and some of that is really, really true. But I say that even if you gave to a rogue ministry or a ministry that didn't have your best intent, that money given from you is your blessing. I don't care what they do with it. That's on them. But I would say this to you. If you understand this precept, you should be shouting at the storehouses of heaven, opening up like floodgates in your life. I don't take this lightly, but I feel like if there's trouble and things are not going the way that they should, I want you to recalculate. I know you know the Bible. I know you've been in church all your life. I know that you got an understanding. But recalculate and see where your heart is when it comes to not just giving financially, but of yourself. Just please check it. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. So the, our Heavenly Father takes me on a journey to Persepolis. I'm like, why am I in Iran this week, Lord? Now, this is how you have to know it's the Lord. I'm in Greencastle, PA. I'm studying Persepolis. Why? He wanted to show me what reverence other false gods have gotten over the millennia, and yet people throw me coins as if they're doing me a favor. Tell my people to return to me, and everything they need will be given to them. So, I'm in Persepolis, and I'm overwhelmed. This is in Persia, and this is a kingdom that was, uh, I think it's 500 BC, so that would be 2,500 years ago. And these people would come. This place is built just to bring offerings. It's where King Cyrus and Darius, it's all uh, uh, Darius or Darius, whatever you say, in the Old Testament, and Ezra and Nehemiah, these were the kings of Persia at that time. And they would have to, these, this place was so opulent. The pillars I'm about to show you are 60 feet high. Um, they dug it up in 1930 because uh, Alexander the Great, uh, um, thank you. I should probably give this to you. 
because you're a better historian than I am. But he, uh, he conquered Persia after 250 years. Greece went in, conquered Persia, and they were having a big feast one night, and his concubine said, why don't we burn it down? And they burn it down. This place was so beautiful. I'll put it on Facebook for you to, this week to look at. I can't even believe I'm talking about this. It's so bizarre. But I'll show you a clip and this clip will give you an idea of how reverence these people came to give a false god an offering so that they wouldn't be tortured or have mayhem or drought. They were so afraid of this god. But in our love, God asks us to come and offer. Um, so in 1930, they're digging up these unbelievable monuments. I mean, this is they would walk these steps. And they would come, the procession from nations would come, every one of them bringing an offering very slowly. And, and this, this place was so opulent and majestic. They were in awe. They knew this had to be God, but it wasn't a God. It was a false God. And I mean, it shows you these, see that, that, uh, they had griffins and bulls and the architecture was phenomenal. And on top of a 60 foot column was that. And it held up a cedar roof. I mean, this place was so intimidate, intimidating and awe-inspiring. Um, they would, again, walk these steps. And this is a recreation. It was built on a 40-foot platform. And it was over a million square feet, like a million three hundred. I, I was going to look that up and try to tell you how many football fields that was, but I, I didn't. Um, let's, would, you, would you indulge me? Um, I'm just going to ask you, Dylan, to put the lights down. This is a quick seven minutes, but take a look. I'll put that whole thing on uh, Facebook if you'd like to see it. I found it incredibly um, eye-opening. And actually, um, um, I was very repentant in my heart. I'm like, Satan is such a counterfeiter. He's a counterfeit. If you see him trying to... He is robbing from God, from this false king. And so what you see there is the imagery of heaven or the imagery of what God had instituted for the Israelites. And all of that giving um, was, usur it was not only mandatory or you're dead. I mean, the, the church would really thrive if that was the case. Um, but it was not out of love. And so they, they gave... They've on their, they were so happy to give. Out of, not, they weren't happy to give. I want us to be happy to give. Um, this is a picture of what God is talking about in Malachi, which I read to you up front. How can a mere mortal rob God? It's with tithes and offerings. And look, if you're a visitor, we don't get a salary. There's nobody here that gets a salary. What we do is we put that money into the kingdom and help people that are in need. This year, for the first time when God is showing me this, he's like, I want you to hold that offering back this, this time. I've never heard that. Not once. Are there many needs? There are many needs. Maui and, and of course, oh my goodness, Libya and, and Morocco and Greece. I could go on. It, it's, but look, please see what a false god tribute looks like? <laughs> and where's our heart with the way we offer to God? Where it's just like, if I can, maybe I might. And I'm like, God, thank you for this because it's worked on my heart. And I want it to work on your heart as well. Again, the agenda for me is to open up the storehouses of heaven for you. You're not doing a thing for me. I've got my money in the kingdom, and we'll continue to do it. And the minute somebody asks me, in church, out of church, hairdressing salon, at the, at the grocery store, about they're having trouble with finances, I'm like, please give. You can't, you got to give. Somehow, you're like, I don't have any money to give. Give your talent. God will supply what you need. Give something. Serve something other than yourself. It's true, guys. I'm telling you. Deuteronomy 16, pastor's going to read for the last time. We've done this for years. Look, I'm looking at some of you. You want property to move. You want something to happen in your life. You want something. God is like, come to me. 
And I'll give you every, seek the kingdom first and everything you need will be added to you. I, I think I put it up. I'm pretty sure. No, no, I didn't. That's all you. This is Deuteronomy 16, 16. A lot of you could probably yeah. quote this. Do it from 15. 15? 15? Starting in 15, for seven days, celebrate the festival to the Lord your God at the place the Lord will show, will show you. For the Lord your God will bless you in all your harvest and in all the work of your hands, and your joy will be complete. Three times a year, all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose, at the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of weeks, and the festival of tabernacles. No one should appear before the Lord empty-handed, each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. A couple observations on this, we've already talked about this, is um, worship where the Lord has shown you, right? Um, so ask him where he wants you. Don't just blindly go somewhere and, and not get, ever, ever get connected. If you're somewhere that, you're, that the Lord shows you, you will be connected. And it also um, denotes intimacy that I'm required to seek or I should seek every part of my life with him not just my spiritual walk either um, it's funny that we go to work and we give the majority of our life and our strength something for money um, if we did that in our spiritual journey how far would we be as human beings and and God will make it easy for you he will open doors for you that there is no way that you can open there's no way I've, I've done it over and over in my life I've been it's it's been an example of my life, uh, on my entire journey with him. Um, I remember um, me working and trying to make my own way um, before I knew him, and then when I was able to turn my life over to him little by little, not right away, it doesn't happen, it didn't happen for me that way anyway, because I'm a little bit of a control freak. Um, so it's little things that he had to pry my fingers off of things that and once my fingers started hurting, I would able to let go a little bit more and more. And it got way better when I wasn't in control of those things. So it's really helped me out in those uh, areas of my life. Um, that you'll see three times a year the men appear and have something in, their, in your hand. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. That's why God wants us to physically connect with our with tithes, with offerings, with what's in our hand. If it means something to you, then he's not saying, I, I want it. I want to pry that out of your hand. He wants you to become connected with that. If you're giving money to this church, your heart, all of a sudden, you want to see our profit and loss statement. Because <laughs> I want to see where my money's going. It's okay. Yeah. It should happen that way. Why do we think that something that ha happens in the physical doesn't mean it echoes in the, the spiritual walk? that we have as well, because it does. Everything that we do is spiritual. When we give, it's spiritual. Um, it's not just, I think the ones with the show, the one with the mic in the hand is deemed spiritual for some reason, and the one that's sitting in the chair does, is not. And that's not true, that we are all connected in this way, in this spiritual way. Um, and also then, when you see the video, Satan... Um, exalted men allowed men to become exalted and then do this to their subjects but they were still subjects they they walked those stairs willingly but they but they were out of fear and God says in Hebrews 4 come boldly into the throne of Christ into the throne of grace the throne of Christ come boldly into that and it didn't say bring something in your hands or with something on your mouth to explain why you're here he just says I want to be with you I don't want anything in your hand that you think you can give me. I don't want to own you. I just want you. That's the way he's always been. We're done. Dan's coming up now. Thank you, Dan, for your patience. Next week, on the 24th, no, it's not a, this is for you guys. This is somebody's going to leave here completely changed for the rest of their lives. Next Sunday, we take a Moedim offering. I want you to walk up. I want you to bless the money. There'll be a basket here. I've done this for 17 years, three times a year for 17 years. Do the math. Jeff, figure that out, three times 17. And then we will 
um, we will bl- David and I will bless that money and we'll put it where the Lord shows us. So you can prepare. Mm-hmm. Again, if you don't have money and you, it's your season and you don't, bring a talent, bring a gift. Maybe you're going to offer to God to take care of your neighbor's dog. I don't know. I'm just, you know, whatever it is. Just give yourself in some way. Danny? All right, guys. Whoa. So we'll get you out of here by 1.30. Just chillax. Nah, just kidding. We're going to keep this short and sweet. Real quick, Hebrews, an intro. You're probably like, what is he talking about? You know what they say. You know how we know that God loves coffee. Because he brews, right? It's the oldest joke in the book. That's why my coffee thing's up there. But um, real quick. Silliness. No, I know you can't, Doug. (laughs) No pun intended, I love it. Doug. So I am going to be short and sweet, but today, Dave and Kathy, when we as a community are are really celebrating what 17 years of community looks like, and just, I mean, it's interesting, this, this Friday, right after work, I got in my car with my family, and we drove to Pittsburgh, and Friday night, we celebrated my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. And so, I mean... It's just a reminder that there's seasons and there's like anniversaries are important for us to stop and pause and to really reflect on where we came from. The you know those 17 years weren't just straight up easy going, <laughs> beautiful all the time. There's a lot of mess, but in the mess it shapes and molds us. We learn so much more through our challenges and through our successes and. and and, and that's the story of following Christ, of discipleship. It's about growth. It's about maturing. It's about learning to love well. It's easy to love people that are flattering to you. It's hard to love your enemies. But that's what we're called to. And, and it's just, I think we need seasons of pause to reflect, to remind ourselves of what we've come through, to remind ourselves of the blessings that we possess, that we sit in now. Do you have the clicker? No, I got it. And so as a community, we, we, we want to take probably the next eight weeks. Really, I could see this taking us almost into the, the Advent season. So just think about that for a second, right? And through October and November, we're going to be working through the book of Hebrews. And we're going to have different teachers each week just take chunks of Hebrews. But we're going to work through this huge book in the New Testament, um, this, this powerful book that really guides us. But before we get there, starting next week, I just want to do a quick 20-minute, 15-minute introduction into Hebrews because I think it's important for us to just lay the groundwork of where we are going. Um, and, and, and for me, the book of Hebrews, uh, first off, just I think it's always good to have a, a, a historical understanding of what the book of Hebrews or where it came from. You know, upstairs with our, with our high school students and middle school students, we've been going through this book and we kind of wrapped it up last week. But the, one of the main teachings of that book is that the Bible was not written to us, but it was written for us. And, and, and when those letters were written to the people 2,000 years ago, when the book of Hebrews, when the letter of Hebrews was written to the community it was coming to, they didn't have to do the historical analysis. They didn't have to do the deep study. Like they, it was literally everything made perfect sense to them. 2,000 years removed from that culture, from that language, from everything. It's okay to say that we need people to help us understand those roots. It doesn't mean that, those, that, that the scriptures don't still speak to us today, but there's, some, there's nuances in there that if we don't understand that culture in time, we're going to get lost in, the, in, in that culture in time. And so it's good that we take some time to just kind of stop and pause. A few things about the book of Hebrews probably estimated that it was written in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, So we're talking, you know, 25 to 30 years after the death and resurrection of our King Jesus. And so this is, Christianity has kind of taken root within Israel, but it started to expand out into the Roman Empire. Um, There was definitely not a mass majority of Christians in the world. Uh, The majority of them were very Jewish still. They were just Jewish people who practiced that Jesus was the one Messiah that all of the old covenant had pointed towards, which is what it is. Um, But it was starting to bring in the Gentile world. At this time, it's really important to understand that there was, as this Christian church and community was starting to grow, 
and starting to spread within the Roman Empire, that there was starting to be these people, in, in, especially in the city of Rome, there was starting to be persecution directly towards followers of Jesus. And so the Roman Empire at that time was doing some persecution. And so there was some Jewish Christians who were like, you know what? It might be easier just to kind of go back to the laws of Moses and kind of just kind of, like, I don't need to deal with all that persecution. And so it was like, there was like this weight that they had to wrestle with. Now, I don't think any Christians in America today are wondering, should I, should I go and become Jewish right now? And so I always am trying to make sense of how does this correlate to us? I do think in our world, and I think when you read the Old Covenant, there's like this Jewish and then a Gentile. There's like these two axes. I think what Jesus brings in in the New Covenant is the world system and the kingdom system. He takes the Old Covenant and he builds upon it. And we're going to talk about that. But I believe that's really what the book of Hebrews is doing, is, is taking the Old Covenant and saying there's something better. There's something better. And you're going to see this over and over again. I'm going to show this to you real quickly through the book of Hebrews. There's something better. And so I'm hoping that this makes sense. As a 2023 American male, how do I take this context out of that? I think there's a lot of times in our Christian walk, there's like, you know what? It might be easier just to kind of go back into my old ways. Does that make sense? Like, I don't... You know, I, I think a lot of times about Jesus' words when he says, my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. Because a lot of the Jewish people in his day had a lot of heavy yokes and a lot of heavy burdens to, to work their way to God's relationship. And Jesus is saying, my yoke is easy and my burdens, I'm not going to put any burdens on you. Yeah. But then later on, Jesus says, but, that, but you're going to pick up a cross and follow me. So his, he, he demands nothing of you. He puts no burdens on you, but in the world, against the world system, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to pick up a cross and follow him. Like he knows there's like this paradox that you have to operate in to follow him. It's not an easy road, but it's not a hard road because of anything he does to you. It's a hard road because of what the world, what Kathy was talking about, what Satan is trying to corrupt in you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so the book of Hebrews is so good. I'm going to read three verses out of the book of Hebrews as an introduction. It's Hebrews 1, chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3, because that's how they introduce it. Before we go any further, who wrote the book of Hebrews? We have no idea. And I love that. It's one of the only books in the New Testament that isn't accredited to an author. Um, the Eastern Orthodox probably accredit mostly to Paul, but I think um, in the West and, and really in the last 500 years, there's a lot of debate. And I think I would say um, I would push against the Paul authorship. It doesn't have any Pauline writings in it. it it's very different than all of Paul's letters. Some people have said <clears throat> Barnabas, Silas. Um, there is a mention of Timothy. So it was somebody who did journey with Timothy. Um, but there, yeah, there's... there's Nobody really knows, and that's where we're at, and that's okay. We don't have to know exactly who wrote it. It was written at the end, and, and there's 13 chapters in the book of Hebrews. In chapter 13, it does say that this letter is coming to Italy, so we can assume probably a church in Rome, um, but this is coming to Italy. Um, it's, it's prepared to a very Jewish culture, a very Jewish church, and so these are Jews who are practicing believers in Jesus' Messiah, Yeshua, and they are, and, and so there's a lot of Jewish context, Hebrews context that they don't have to lay out because the reader of the letter knows the story of the old covenant. But let's just get into it real quick. So in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, and this is what we're going to read today. This is so good. And let me just tell you, this part of scripture is one of the most this is one of my favorite pieces of scripture in all of the Bible. This is so weighty and so good. Whoever wrote this was freaking on fire. But anyways, it says in Hebrews 1, it says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets as many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us directly by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through him also he made the universe. 
The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by the powerful word. After he had provided purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Amen, right? It's so, there's so much in this three small verses. But this writer of the book of Hebrews, I love it. He's not saying that the old covenant is, was no good or null and void. He says, God has been speaking to us for generations and generations. He has been using the prophets in the old covenant. Most, and he's going to go through it all throughout this letter. All those people weren't bad, but they were the radiant representation of who God is. Um, N.T. Wright uses this example. He says that word um, representation. representation. He says it's actually in the Hebrew, in the Greek, in the Greek language, the word is character. And not like, he says, it's kind of like, think of like a character in a play, but it's also like a character, like a letter. Like we have the alphabet, we have 26 characters in our alphabet. And he says, to the, to the reader of the first century, this, this word, it's like the, the emperor of Rome had a stamp it was made of metal. He had a hard metal and he stamped it into something. And that stamp represented him into the world. It was the character. His character was represented into the world, the Roman emperors. And so this is God putting his stamp in human flesh in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the exact representation of who the Father is. If you want to know what God looks like, Hebrews 1, 2, and 3 says, look at Jesus. Look to Jesus. Yes, up until that time, there was, there was, there was, there, there was, you know, people were heard things. God spoke through the prophets, and there was people who were who were in tune. And the, and the people of Israel were chosen and selected to help help guide us to the point. But when God shows up in flesh, it is Christ Himself, and He is the One who now sits at the right hand of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, the Son, He is the Son. He sits at the right hand of the Father. And, and, and so the writers of Hebrews is setting this up in a very Jewish context to a Jewish community because what we're going to see throughout the next 13 chapters is that what Jesus represents is the new covenant. And the new covenant is superior. It is better than the old covenant. It's better revelation, one through one, chapter one. It's better expectations. It's better priesthood. It's better hope. It's a better testament and covenant. This is all throughout the book of Hebrews. It's a better promise. It's a better sacrifice. It's better possessions. It's better uh, country. It's a better resurrection. It's just better things. Like you can go and take all those Hebrew, all those verses out of Hebrews, and he's taking this people who are wrestling with the persecution that is coming to follow Jesus and saying, let me tell you, don't turn away from this because it's so much better. And it's the light of, this is the true, this is the true covenant. This is what God has been doing since the foundations of the earth. It's what's going to get us there. And so in his person, Christ is better than the angels. He's better than Moses and he's better than Joshua. I tell you this because we're going to be going through the book of Hebrews and it wouldn't make sense if you no, don't have this history because we're going to jump right into angels real soon in, chapter, in verse 4, chapter 1, the very next verse. It's going to be talking about angels. And the whole point is that in Deuteronomy, it says that the angels gave the law to Moses. And so there's this hierarchy within Jewish context where angels are superior in a sense. And, and, and the writers of Hebrews is helping them understand that Christ is superior to all things. To Moses, who is the, the, the I would say, the alpha of, of the Jewish people. And so he's going to take you through three and four, that he is superior to Moses. I mean, Dave mentioned it this morning. We come with, well, we come with unveiled face in 1 Corinthians, right? Where Moses had a veiled face. Like we, because we follow Christ, are in a new covenant, well, we come with unveiled faces in the glory of God. And he goes in through Joshua. And then in his performance, Christ, Christ provides a better priesthood, a better sanctuary, a better covenant, and a better sacrifice. It's so good. And so this next couple weeks, over the next, you know, all through October and into November, we're going to be working our way through this book because we think it's super important. We think it's super important. 
And before we get to, to, to the table, I just want to, I just feel like, you know, I think of myself as a follower of Christ. And I think back to, like I said, we just celebrated my parents' 50th anniversary. And so my sister who lives in Florida now, she was a year and a half older than me. And her and I were probably the closest to growing up just because of age, but also just through life experiences. And I was 16 and she was 17. We were very close in high school. And I can remember very, very clearly her and I and, and riding in a car and her and I having conversations just about who Jesus is. And we grew up in a very Jesus centered family, um, loved, you know, it was, it was, it, it was an experience that I have to myself. Anyways, I was always taught about Jesus. I was in church a lot, but we also just like, to me, it was always the conversation with her was, you know what? I love Jesus. He's so good. Like, but I really am going to have some fun. And when I, you know, when I'm older, I'm going to get married. When we start having a family, then I think I'll really commit my life to Jesus. You know, because the world's pretty cool too. And I'm going to have a lot of fun. And Jesus, dude, he's so cool. I love him. But I'll get there someday. And let me tell you, it didn't end up like that at all. Okay? Because I went out and I had my fun. I had a lot of fun. And that fun brought on a lot of heartache and a lot of pain and a lot of shame and a lot of guilt. And I was on my knees when I said, Jesus, I need you in my mid-20s, right? Like, my roadmap to Jesus was so, like, everything I thought it shouldn't have been, it was. And I say that because the Jesus in the book of Hebrews is the magnitude Jesus. He is the Jesus that created the foundations of the world. I feel like in our culture, sometimes we have that Jesus is cool dude, Jesus. You know, like, I just, I'll have him on my, he's, he can be my sidekick, and I'll, I'll roll with him when I want to, but I really like doing this thing in this world. That, you know, it's like this toss-up. It's like the Gentiles and the Jewish community in the Old Covenant. It's kind of like the world and the kingdom. I kind of want to be both in and both out. But what the writers of Hebrews is showing us is that you can't play that game. Like, and Jesus is so worth it. Like, he's talking to people in probably Rome who are probably watching other fellow Christians die and be persecuted and saying, trust me, it is so worth it. It's the only way to live. And because of that grace that was poured out on them, we walk in the grace today. Like this is why we need to look to the founders. We need to look to our church fathers and mothers. We need to learn the whole history. We need to not think that we got it going on because without that foundation that was laid for the last 2,000 years, we have nothing. And so Christ is king, Hebrews is telling us. It's better than any covenant because it's a new covenant that is superior to all covenants. And it is the final covenant. And so this book that we're going to be going through over the next probably eight weeks, uh, we want to really take it slow and just kind of really dissect what that means about the angels, what it means about Moses, what it means about Joshua, how this covenant's better than the old covenant, and make sense of it because we understand the value of this word that was given to us to take us to where we are called to be today. And so we love. And we love well, right? You do? Nice. Oh, beautiful. We got a beautiful community. I said I was going to try to keep it short and sweet. That's not too bad.